<clears throat> so today we are very pleased to welcome Brandon Hassett uh, to give the Distinguished Colloquium series of the Turkish Math Society. Um, Brandon Hassett received his PhD in 1996 from Harvard University under the supervision of Joe Harris. Um, after a postdoc at U of University of Chicago and several visiting positions, he was at Rice University from 2000 to 2015, including the chair between 2009 and 2014, where he left as the Milton Brockett uh, Porter Professor of Mathematics. Since 2015, he has been at Brown, uh, where he is currently the Jonathan Nelson University Professor, and he is also the director of ISORM. He has numerous uh, awards and accolades, uh, including a Sloan Fellowship, the fellow, he is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society, and a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science. We are very pleased to have uh, Brandon Hassett give this colloquium. Please, uh, Brandon. Thanks, Azat. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to this group. Um, so my goal for today is to tell you a little bit about what rationality is and how it remains a pretty challenging problem as you look at uh, different, different hypersurfaces and varieties. And so let me start with the basic foundations. Um, and so for the most part today, I'm going to work over the complex numbers. And so X is going to be a smooth complex projective variety of dimension N. And I'm going to look at the, the field of rational functions. And so these are functions that can be expressed as quotients of polynomials um, with respect to some embedding of X into projective space. Um, and so for example, if, if X is projective space itself, um, then the rational functions are just given as um, the, the quotients of the linear coordinates, x0 through divided by x, x1 divided by x0 through xn divided by x0. And so you can see that this is a, a field that is uh, freely generated by n indeterminate elements. Um, so these xi through x0 are algebraically independent. And whenever you have such a collection of algebraically independent elements, you can use these to, to, to get a, a birational map from the affine n space into the variety involved. And so here, this map, if you take affine n space to have um, parameterizing coordinates t1 through tn, the map is just to assign ti to the quotient xi through x0. Um, and so in some sense, we want to think about the these rational functions as a sort of finitely generated field over the complex numbers as a fundamental invariant of the variety x. And so the definition is that the variety X is rational if as the, the, the field of, of rational functions is in fact a purely transcendental extension T1 through Tn where N is a number of variables. In some sense, these are the simplest possible fields that you can describe that are finitely generated over the complex numbers. Essentially, the idea here is that there, is no, there are no relations between these generators T1 through Tn. Um, for most varieties, uh, you will have some generators, but also relations between them that encode the defining equations of X. And so here I'm saying, at least in some realization, there aren't any relations between these elements. And so I'm going to recast this in more geometric terms. And so, um, so a variety X is rational if we have a diagram from affine N space in X that induces an isomorphism between uh, an open subset of affine space with an open subset of X. Um, and so here, when I talk about open subsets, I do it in algebraic geometry terms. And so a closed subset in algebraic geometry is just the solution to, to some collection of polynomials. And an open subset is a complement to such a, to such a, a locus. Um, and so basically we're removing a whole bunch of loci where our rational functions have poles where the, the parameterizing map isn't well-defined. And so if I go back to the example before, so the map from Pn to An, the inverse to this map row, it's not well-defined where X0 vanishes. Um, and so there you have a, a pole. And so in general, you just remove the locus um, where these defining functions, these parameterizing elements have poles. 
And then you get an actual isomorphism between these varieties. And so rational varieties behave well under some standard operations. If you have a product of two rational varieties, it's rational as well. So if you take the generators T1 through Tn for the function field of X and the generators S1 through SR for the function field of Y, you just concatenate them together and you get generators for the function field of the product. And so based on this, it's natural to consider the notion of a stably rational variety. Uh, a variety is stably rational if it becomes uh, rational after taking a product with a projective R space. Another way of saying this is that a variety is stably rational if you, as you adjoin R additional elements, you get a field extension that is freely generated by T1 through Tn plus R. Uh, so, so this notion of stable rationality is similar to other stable notions where something becomes rational after taking a product with a, a, a elementary object. Here, the elementary object is projective space. And so I'd like to take a moment to talk about low dimensional examples to develop an inventory of rational varieties. And so the basic takeaway you should have is that varieties of a very small degree have a chance to be rational and almost everything else is never rational. And so let's start with curves. Um, and so Riemann surfaces, uh, the main invariant of a Riemann surface is a genus G. Um, and so this, this genus can be interpreted in topological terms as the number of holes of the underlying Riemann surface. Or in complex analytic terms, it's another number of holomorphic forms on X, a number of independent holomorphic forms on X. These are equivalent by, um, by the Dram isomorphism and basics of Hodge theory. And so uh, a fundamental result, which I suspect goes back to Riemann, if not further in history, is that a curve is rational in our sense precisely when it has genus zero. And the only uh, rational curves, smooth projective rational curves are actually the projective line. And so in some sense, rational examples are, are really uh, fairly boring in, in, in dimension one because there's exactly one rational example. And so let me show you how for a concrete instance, these parameterizations work. And so consider the uh, curve x squared plus y squared equals one, which I think of as being like a circle, even though um, we're working over the complex numbers, you should visualize this as a circle. Um, I can write this as a projective variety by finding a homogeneous equation for x. And so the parameterization can be um, written down as follows. You just let rho go from a1 to x, and the parameter t goes to uh, t squared plus one, two t, or t squared minus one. And there's an explicit inverse map that comes from projection from one of the points on the, on the curve. And so this is an example of how these genus zero curves have explicit parameterizations by, by, by rational functions. On the other hand, if you take larger degree plane curves, um, so plane curves of degree d, uh, where D is greater than or equal to three. So this means it's defined by a homogeneous form in X0, X1, or X2 in, uh, of degree D in those variables. These are never rational. And so the reason is that there are always holomorphic forms on these higher degree plane curves. For instance, a, a plane cubic curve has a everywhere non-vanishing one form because, well, it's an elliptic curve. And so the number of these forms is, is given by an explicit expression, and um, it's non-zero. And so this is an instance of Riemann's result that um, a variety is, is rational precisely when it has no holomorphic one forms. Um, and so in general, whenever you have curves of larger degree, where larger degree tends to be sort of you know, complete intersections given by polynomials of uh, of degree at least three, you always have situations like this where you can produce holomorphic one forms that show that they're not rational. Okay, and so let me talk about surfaces. And so um, this surface S equals X squared plus Y squared equals one 
is rational with a, a rational parameterization given by these complicated rational functions. Um, and so S and T goes to these things. And so I'm gonna write down a picture in a moment to sort of explain uh, what this looks like. Well, let me see if I have, yeah. So let me write a picture to, to explain what's happening here. So here's a picture to understand this. So suppose that we have a sphere. Hmm, all right. Well, I'm having trouble with pictures. So I'm gonna go back to the main part of my talk because, well, sorry, there's no pictures, but I'll try to get this working in a, in a moment. My uh, pen died. So let me return to the main. Okay, so. So basically the idea here is that the surface x squared plus y squared equals one is, um, is, is a sphere and stereographic projection from the North Pole gives this complicated rational function. Um, and so this gives you a, a, a birational parameterization of the sphere by points on the plane. Okay, so let's go to larger degrees. So suppose that we have a surface x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed equals one. So this also has a rational parameterization. Um, so th the map rho from a2 to s is given by s comma t going to these expressions, um, where g is s squared plus st plus t squared divided by cube. And so this is um, a parameterization that's a little more complicated to explain, but I'll, in the next slide, I'll, I'll give a little bit of explanation a little bit of background as to where it's coming from. So here's where the proof comes from. And so this is probably the only thing I'll really prove in this lecture. So suppose that we have a cubic surface um, containing two disjoint lines, L1 and L2. So I have S sitting in P3 and L1 and L2 are, are straight lines and they have no points in common. And so then these surfaces are necessarily rational. And it turns out that the parameterization that I've described here uses some of the lines on the surface. If you see the surface S has quite a number of lines, for instance, if I let X equals a six root of unity of Y and Z is equal to a third root of unity, that, 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 that these give you a, a number of lines that you can explicitly parameterize. There's in fact, 27 lines on the cubic surface. And using those lines, we can get an explicit parameterization of S. Um, and so this is obtained geometrically as follows. If I take these lines L1 and L2, um, and I take points on those lines, the map onto X is obtained by looking at the span of the, the points on the lines. And then I take that and I intersect it with S. And that intersection, consists of three points because every cubic polynomial has three roots. Two of the points are accounted for, L1 and L2. The third point X is the additional point that we want to specify through the parameterization. Um, and so the inverse of this map is obtained from the unique line um, through a given point instant to L1 and L2. So let me uh, step back a little bit from the examples and talk about classification results. Um, before I do this, are there any questions or comments?
Okay, well then I'll I'll press on. So I like to basically tell you what, from the perspective of algebraic geometry, are the constraints that would would bar um, bar various varieties from being rational. Um, and so this is kind of a, a long and wordy slide, but it sort of is the summary of what's known from a negative perspective. Um, and so suppose that X is a smooth projective surface, although most of what I'm saying here actually applies in higher dimensions without much in a way of changes. Um, so then the surface, if the surface is rational, then it has, as we've seen, no holomorphic one forms, or in fact, no holomorphic tensors at all. And so going back to the results of Riemann, we saw that a curve is rational if there are no holomorphic one forms, those holomorphic one forms being a sort of topological or holomorphic obstruction to, to a, a rational prioritization. And this is true in, in, in higher dimensions as well. So if you have a rational variety, then there's no holomorphic tensors whatsoever. One forms, two forms, uh, symmetric powers of one forms. Um, and so in particular, there are no powers of these sort of canonical bundles that are used to represent the, the, the positivity or negativity of X in algebraic sense. And the basic reason for this is that these, these spaces of tensors are in fact birational invariants. And so since they're birational invariants, if I want to evaluate them on a variety X, it's equivalent to evaluate them on projective space, say P2 in the, in the surface case. And a direct computation on the projective plane shows that there are no holomorphic tensors of any kind on the projective plane. And therefore there can be no such tensors on any variety that is rationally equivalent to the plane. And so this gives you a very powerful tool for showing that almost all the varieties that you meet as defined by equations are, are not actually rational um, because they'll usually come with some kind of holomorphic tensors. I see there's something in the chat. Is there a topological characterization like lower dimension? Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a topological characterization, I think, in the next slide. So, um, and so then let me see if this helps sort of address the question. Um, so one topological condition that precludes rationality is um, any rational variety has trivial fundamental group. And here, let me emphasize that X is smooth and projective. Um, and so basically the idea is, is, is that when you, um, carry out by rational modifications. Um, you know, when you do the uh, rational maths that arise through the uh, parameterization process, you're essentially taking closed subsets or subvarieties of Y and you're, you're blowing them up. You're, you're sort of, um, you're, you're expanding them out, but that doesn't change the fundamental group because the modifications that you're making are in complex co-dimension two or larger. And so these birational parameterizations, they, they don't change a fundamental group. If you remove something in, in co-dimension, complex co-dimension two or real co-dimension four, the fundamental group isn't changed. And so, um, so this is one reason why, um, this is one reason why you have a, a topological constraints on rationality that the fundamental group is, um, is a birational invariant. And so, this comment here on smooth surfaces, they're being never rational. Um, this is a consequence of what I've written on this previous slide, that, that there are the rational varieties carry no holomorphic tensors. Um, and so here, if you have a, a surface of degree at least four, then there are holomorphic two forms. Similarly, a product of plane curves of higher degrees is never rational because they have fundamental group a non-trivial fundamental group from the from the factors, and so um, so, but does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. What about the homology? You we don't have anything about homology, right? Well, so 
we do know that um, a rational variety has a property that there's no torsion in H3. Um, so one of the difficulties though, is that if you have say a, um, a complex projective variety and I put it in projective space and then I blow up, the cohomology of that subvariety shows itself in the cohomology of the blow up. And so in some sense, the cohomology of rational varieties contains the cohomology of all complex projective varieties, but complex projective varieties is a smaller dimension. So for instance, if you have three folds, the cohomology contain all the cohomology of curves or four folds, cohomology of rational fourfolds has all the cohomology of rational surfaces. And so cohomology that arises on a complex projective variety can be realized on a rational variety, but the dimension is, is somewhat larger. So basically, the I think the only comp very general topological constraints I can cite are the um, vanishing of the fundamental group and the non-existence of torsion in, in, in the third cohomology. So, so does that, I think yeah, that's about, thank you. yeah, okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, yeah, actually my, I'm going to write down what I said because now I actually can, the, my, my writing thing unfroze. So let me try to write down the answer to the question that I had. Okay, so, so if X is rational, it follows that the fundamental group is trivial and there's no torsion in the third cohomology. Um, so this is, so these are the constraints. On the other hand, if I have Y as an arbitrary projective variety, and I embed Y in some projective space, so PN, and then I carry out a process where I blow up Y, So here I'm basically adjoining all the normal directions to Y. So then the cohomology of Y, this injects into the cohomology of the blow up. But with a with a shift in degrees. So basically all the cohomology of varieties can be realized in rational varieties, but the dimensions grow. All right, while I have my writing, is there any other questions that I can answer? I'd be very happy to have this be more interactive. Okay, then I'm gonna shift back to the main. So there are positive results, uh, namely that if, if you have a smooth complex projective surface such that all of these holomorphic tensors vanish, um, then X isn't rational. Uh, excuse me, then X is always rational. Casanova and Riquet has proved this result, and they actually give an effective criterion for deciding rationality. If there are no holomorphic... Don't see your slides. Ah, okay.
Can you see them now? Yes. Okay, good. So let me repeat what I was saying. So if you have a, a surface and you know that there are no one forms and uh, no bicanonical differentials, so no elements of the second square of the canonical bundle, uh, then you actually know that they're rational. So in particular, in the case of surfaces, many of the notions of having lots of rational curves, stably rational, rational, they all coincide and they're characterized through these holomorphic tensors. And so one general question, and this I think reflects the, 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 the impetus to try to have a topological characterization of rationality is to ask, well, to what extent do numerical invariants, invariants that are uh, unchanging on, on, on components of, of moduli, to what extent do these numerical invariants characterize rationality? These could be topological invariants, like uh, fundamental groups, but also invariants that are more algebra geometric, like for holomorphic forms or for canonical forms. Um, so can you have a family of rational varieties um, with non-rational limits, or can you have a family of non-rational varieties that acquires rational members? And so the idea here is uh, I'm looking at a, 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 a smooth projective family of complex varieties, X over B. And then we just say, oh, let rat B be the set of all points of the base where the corresponding fiber is rational. And then stable rat of B be the corresponding collection of points in the base where the fibers are stably rational. The rat locus, rat B is contained in stable rat B. And so are these loci open or closed? What kind of structure do they have? If rationality were characterized by numerical invariance, then you would have an alternative, either rat B is all of B or rat B is empty and nothing in between. But if rationality is sort of a, a, an algebraic notion that depends on the exact shape of the coefficients, um, then you might have circumstances where the locus of rational varieties has some intricate structure. And so this is, this is a general structural characteristic we want to ask. To what extent are there numerical invariants maybe of a algebra geometric nature that can be used to characterize rationality. And so this is a natural thing to ask for given the castle Nova and Rehquist criterion where they basically say, oh, you check these conditions. If these conditions hold, then you have rationality. And so is this, is this something that we can look for, expect in, 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 in higher dimensions? Are there any questions about this, about this fundamental point I wanna emphasize? This is actually, one of the main things I want to convey in the talk. Okay, let me continue. So, um, so suppose that we have a, sm a smooth projective family over a connected base. And so Kontsevich and Schinkel, respectively Nikes and Schinder, show that the, the rational locus, or respectively the stably rational locus, is actually closed under specialization. And so what that means is that there's a, a countable uh, union of closed subvarieties that describe the rational or stably rational uh, loci. And so unfortunately, the, the, the locus is not necessarily open. There are instances where rationality fails to be an open condition in dimension four. Um, so if you take hypersurfaces and P2 cross P3, uh, degree two in both sets of variables. These are generally not stably rational, but many special instances of them happen to be rational. The same thing holds for stably rational varieties, even in dimension three. So let me try to draw a picture that sort of gives a schematic here.
Okay. So, so here, so I have some family of varieties. And here, so here's my schematic of the base. And over the points, I have fibrous. And then what I'd like to do is I'd like to characterize the, 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 the rational locus um, corresponding to the B with its XB is rational. And the, the picture is, is that this consists of a countable union of subvarieties in general. And so the, the non-rational examples they correspond to, to points in the complement of this countable union. And so in many cases, the so this locus here that I've described here, this rational locus, so this is a countable union. Of some varieties. Um, so in many locus, this can, this can be everywhere dense and, and be. Um, so they can be thick on the ground, assuming it's not empty. Uh, so th this is a general picture that you have In some sense, most of the, the points are non-rational, but there's a countable union of special subvarieties that give you rational examples. And so the recent theorems say that, so, so in dimensions greater than four, you can have that, the rational locus is non empty, but strictly contained in the, in the base of the family. So this is sort of the, a, a picture that summarizes the, the structural results that we have as of today. Okay, so let me, are there any questions about this? Okay, let me go back then to the to the slides. Okay. You can see my slides, correct? Yes. Good, okay. So now let me turn to some concrete examples of hypersurfaces to show you where, where we are in our understanding in terms of these rationality criteria. Um, and so let me talk about cubic three folds first. So let me just remind you, sorry to jump around, we spent some time looking at the case of cubic surfaces and, and we saw that cubic surfaces have these explicit rational parameterizations. Um, we also saw that quadratics have explicit rational parameterizations. In fact, the formula that I've written here, a version of it works in, in arbitrary dimensions to show that quadratic equations have rational parameterizations. So the next open case that is um, available is cubic three folds. And so in light of the question about sort of topological or at least uh, invariant characterizations of rationality, let me spell out what those mean for, for three-dimensional varieties. And so the basic point is, is that for a three-fold, the fundamental numerical invariants are given by the Hodge numbers. So the cohomology with coefficients in um, 
in the holomorphic forms or the exterior powers of the holomorphic forms. The results that I state, stated before, the general classification revol results, tell you that most of these Hodge numbers are zero. The only non-zero Hodge numbers are sort of in the middle of the cohomology. And so in some sense, this reflects what I mentioned that if you're going to have interesting cohomology in a rational variety, it's sort of shifted by degrees, reflecting the fact that something was blown up in the process. And so specifically, the invariant that you get is if you look at the third cohomology, you can extract a, a, an abelian variety, a principally polarized abelian variety, just by looking at the complex cohomology modeling out by the, the integer cohomology and the appropriate Dobo cohomology. This gives you a, an abelian variety that is an invariant of X called the intermediate Jacobian. Um, and so when you blow up a curve, again, this is a picture I drew just a moment ago. When you blow up a curve in a, in a threefold, um, basically we cut out C and replace it with a, a surface fibered in, in, in projective lines over C. Then the Jacobian that of this blown up surface is just the Jacobian of the curve that you've blown up plus a Jacobian of the threefold that you start off with. So in particular, Clemens and Griffiths have shown that when uh, X is rational, when it's obtained by blowing up a uh, projective space, then it's Jacobian, it's intermediate Jacobian is just a sum of the Jacobian of some curves. Curves are blown up in the rational parameterization of the threefold. And so <clears throat> when you have a, a cubic threefold, the relevant Hodge diamond is given like this. So you have a, a principally polarized abelian variety of dimension five. And so the Jacobian is five dimensional. And then in the 1960s, Clemens and Griffiths undertook a systematic analysis of um, the geometric properties of the Jacobians of these cubic threefolds and showed through a very delicate computation that the cubic threefolds are never rational uh, because their intermediate Jacobians never have the structure of the Jacobian of a curve. And so th this is a, a really um, foundational result and it supports the general philosophy that you want to look into the cohomology of a variety in order to evaluate whether it has a rational prioritization. But it leaves one key question open. So are QB threefolds ever stably rational? As things stand today, no QB threefold has been shown to be stably rational or been shown not to be stably rational. So the, the question is almost completely determinate, indeterminate as of this time, whether QB threefolds after, you know, if you take a product of a cubic threefold with a projective line or projective space of higher dimensions, whether it becomes rational. So if they are stably rational, you can actually see invariance in, in, term, in the cohomology. And so this is an area of quite active research. So if you have a, a stably rational threefold, um, if you look at the, 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 the two-dimensional Hodge classes, so these are the classes in, in H2 that are have a, a chance to arise from algebraic cycles. So the intersection of H2 with the, the, the classes of, of, of type 4-4 four, four. in the complex cohomology, this has to be generated by, um, by the classes of algebraic curves. In the jargon of Hodge theory, it says X satisfies the integral Hodge conjecture. And for cubic threefolds, Fousson shows that this holds for an infinite collection of the families in the moduli space of cubic threefolds. But might it always be true? Um, this is a little unclear. And so I want to emphasize a, a key point here, which is, let me go back to the picture.
So remember, we were looking at the structural characteristics of families of um, families of rational varieties, and I talked about the the the, the rat rocus, and there's something similar for similarly for the stable the stable rat. locus, you have a countable union. But the key thing is, is that the, if you look at these pictures, so the, so the locus where the integral Hodge conjecture holds is also Accountable union of some varieties in moduli space. And so obviously these contain the green ones, um, but are these countable unions of sub varieties? Are they the same? Are they different? Can we sort of draw, can we draw a contrast between them? And so this is sort of one of the fundamental motivating pictures, how do you actually realize explicitly what these various loci might be and, and nice examples. And so for cubic threefolds, we actually have very little understanding except that the, the um, integral Hodge conjecture does actually uh, hold an accountable number of loci and moduli. It might hold everywhere, but we don't have the technology to prove that at, at the moment. Okay. I have a, a few minutes left, um, so let me raise one more open question for threefolds before going on to the fourfold case. So I spent some time explaining how rationality was um, an open condition for curves and surfaces and not an open condition for fourfolds and higher. I just want to lay out explicitly that we do not know in general whether rationality is an open condition for threefolds. Like the Poincaré conjecture and you know other geometric problems, sometimes dimension three is a case where most of the pain, most of the difficulty seems to be um, seems to be localized. And so it's an open problem whether rationality is is an open condition. Whether if you have a family of smooth projected threefolds and one member is rational, all the nearby Fibers should also be rational. We don't know the answer to this at the moment. Um, given the number of concrete examples where this is true, I, my personal feeling is that this seems pretty likely, um, but we don't have good uh, tools for actually proving this is the case given existing technology. We know that stable rationality is not an open condition, but rationality itself, this remains a, a challenge for the future. Okay, let me turn to the four-dimensional case. And so by cubic fourfold, I just mean a cubic hypersurface in P5. So given by a homogeneous cubic form now in six variables. Um, and so there are many concrete instances of rational examples for these, um, for these varieties. So for instance, if I have a cubic fourfold containing uh, two disjoint planes, it's rational. And this essentially the argument I just sketched out for the surface case. You, um, you take the two planes, you draw lines between them, you see where those lines meet, the ambient variety, and um, that gives you sort of the third point construction. So cubic fourfolds containing disjoint planes, P2s, um, are rational. Another classical example that uh, has been known to be rational for a long time is determinantal cubic hypersurfaces. Determinantal in the sense that you can write the equation of, of F as a determinant of a six by six matrix that is skew symmetric, but the, the determinant of a six by six skew symmetric matrix is a square. And so the square root of that is a cubic. And so when you're your equation happens to take this uh, Fafian form, then the varieties are rational. So there are many rational examples. 
it's been a challenge to try to understand conceptually why some are rational and some aren't. And so this has been uh, an active area of research uh, for at least the last 30 years. Uh, let me point out a conjectural framework um, developed by Sasha Kuznetsov um, with important inputs uh, from, from Nick Addington and Richard Thomas. So here's a conjecture. Um, so uh, a cubic fourfold is rational if its cohomology might arise from blowing up a K3 surface. So in other words, that if you take the transcendental cohomology of the K3 surface, the part that doesn't come from algebraic cycles on the surface, that that admits a saturated embedding into the cohomology of the fourfold. Uh, so the, the part of the cohomology that's orthogonal to the algebraic cycles. And so if this were the case, uh, then the rational examples would form a countable union of, in fact, co-dimension one subvarieties in moduli space. And so let me sort of draw a picture of what that might look like. Okay, so, so here is a schematic of the moduli space. Of cubic fourfolds. And so this is 20 dimensional. I'm going to take the artistic, artistic convention that I reduce all dimensions by 18 here. So something that's um, flat is 20 dimensional. Um, something that is a line is is is, a, is 19 dimensional. And so here are the expected rational examples. based on the conjecture of Kuznetsov and Addington Thomas. So there's a accountable collection of some varieties of increasing degrees that are rational that actually fill out the moduli space. And so these are all 19 dimensional And so this is let me emphasize here, this is conjectured. We don't know how to prove this yet. Uh, so, so this is the general picture that we, we would hope would be the case here. So let me go back. So why is this? reasonable, why would we expect that the, the surfaces would control the rationality? And so it's basically a, a numerical accident. If you look at the, the numerical invariance of K3 surfaces, um, it has this shape here. And if you look at the numerical invariance of cubic fourfold, it has a shape here and 21 and 22 are, are not that far apart. And so you might think that the, the this diamond here that you can sort of try to insert it into the diamond of the cubic fourfold, and that that should reflect the possibility that the K3 surface might be blown up in a parameterization of the fourfold. And so this numerology is really why I think this, this, um, this perspective has developed over the last 30 years, that the, the small triangle can possibly be sort of sitting inside of the, the, the larger triangle in the middle. So, on the other hand, we have very few techniques for proving things. There are no proofs in the literature of cubic fourfolds um, that they're irrational. Um, the conjectures I laid out would say that in the complement of this countable union of 
chronometer one subvarieties, all of them are irrational. Uh, there's no way to sort of peel off a K3 surface. But um, while this has been announced recently in, uh, in, in, in lectures by Katsarkov, Konsevich, Pantev, and you, we don't have a, well, I, this hasn't been publicly disseminated yet. The techniques um, involve things that are quite different from what I've been talking about. So the ideas come from homological mirror symmetry and they use significant inputs from non-commutative geometry. So if this does turn out to become a theorem in the, in, the, in the near future, there'll be a lot of new technology that we'll have to learn in order to, well, at least I'll have to learn in order to fully understand how, how you prove the irrationality. Um, we don't, this doesn't seem to be accessible through the, the off the shelf techniques that we have at the moment. And so let me show you a quick inventory of rational examples, just to give you a sense of what we know how to do. And so when I record rational examples, I actually will record them by keeping track of the numerical invariance of the algebraic cycles of the surfaces. And so I mentioned at the beginning of this segment that cubic fourfolds containing uh, a pair of disjoint planes are rational. And so if I look at the cohomology of such a cubic fourfold, it has the, the, the algebraic cycles take the following form. So P1 and P2 are the planes. The fact that they intersect at zero points means that they're disjoint. Uh, my Chern class computation shows that they have self-intersection three. And the fact that they're planes, they have degree one, they intersect the, the square of the hyperplane class in degree one. That's just essentially the Bazoo theorem. And so when I want to consider a class of cubic fourfolds characterized by having these cycles, I'll use this, this uh, intersection matrix as a shorthand for it. So I'm basically just computing the intersections of the algebraic cycles following the convention that the hyperplane class is always listed first. So whenever I have something like this, there'll be a three in the upper left-hand corner reflecting the, the fact that, 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 well, you always have the hyperplane class on any cubic fourfold. And so that gives you some co-dimension two algebraic cycles. All right, and so here are all the cases where, where we know rationality. Um, and so these are all broadly consistent with the conjectures of Addington and Thomas. And so the, um, the first case where AX is equal to 3, 4, 4, 10, that's the uh, Fafian case. And so there are some other cases that have been developed. So these four cases are divisorial loci and the subsequent cases are codimension two loci and moduli. And so, these have been done over an 80 year period. Um, so Fano wrote a, a really important uh, guiding paper in this area where he discussed um, the, the, some of the nicer, more accessible rational examples. Um, also, he showed that a naive argument that they should all be rational is incorrect. Um, Boville Donaghi formalized the Fafian example in the eighties. I worked on this coming out of my thesis. And the recent exciting results of Russo and Stagliano have given lots of new rational examples in co-dimension one. And um, there are a number of interesting examples in co-dimension two that have been described here. And so basically the picture is that we have uh, four divisorial loci and a countable collection of co-dimension two loci where they're known to be rational. Okay, I think I've gone 55 minutes, and so I'm going to, to stop there. Thank you very much for your patience. It was great to, to sh share this work with you. Thank you, Brandon. Let me thank you and on behalf of everyone and sort of uh, clap for everyone. Um, are there any questions? I have one. Yes. Okay. So, so David, do you want to go first and then maybe Burst can go next? Yeah. Okay, hi, thanks. Um, so I think you just said that 
um, a cubic fourfold with two disjoint planes is is rational. Correct. Are you there? And is that for the same reason that a cubic surface? Back at the beginning, you said you gave the argument about with a cubic surface when you take two disjoint lines in it, this gives you a parameterization. Is this the same idea? Yeah. So the, uh, let me draw a picture. So suppose here that, sorry, all my higher dimensional varieties look the same, but X is a cubic fourfold. And then I, here I'm taking P1 and P2. These are the, the disjoint planes. So here, here is P1, here is P2. And then if I take points in these P1 and P2, I can draw a line joining those points together. Mm -hmm. And so here is a so this is a span of P1 and P2. And so this general construction gives you a map from P1 plus P2 to X, where I take P1 and P2. And I map, I really wanted to draw this picture, so I'm going to take the time to do it. Um, so I, I map it to X where the span of P1 and P2 intersected with X is given by little x, P1 and P2. And so here the span I've drawn here, this is a, a line. Right. So, so I think so this confused me. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah, maybe I was confused initially. You mean you're taking the affine span of the set of those two points. Yeah. Rather mm -hmm. than the span of the two planes together, because that would be the whole space, I guess. Yeah. I'm 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 taking the yeah, the affine spans of the two points that I've chosen. And right. then I'm letting okay. points vary. Right. And in okay. fact, this is something that works in, in all even dimensions. If this is a two M fold and these are M planes, then the same argument works. Uh -huh. you rational examples in all even dimensions. Okay, uh, great. That's um, that clears it up. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Paris, you had the question, right? Yeah, I have uh, one small question, maybe. So you mentioned that uh, there is no known uh, stable uh, rational three false norm, right? Can you? I I find it a bit surprising. Can you speculate on it? Why is this the case? Oh. I mean, what is the problem there? So um, so for three folds. So so there there do exist um three folds that are stably rational but not rational. Um but what's open is so are there cubic threefolds that are stably rational. I see, okay. Yeah, I see, okay then, yeah. This is an open question. So the, the non-rational, stably rational examples, this is a, a, a paper from the 80s due to um, Bauville, Julio Talan, um, Swinderton Dyer, and I think Sansuk. 
think that that's, those are the authors. They show that there are three folds. They're stably rational, but not rational. But the, the constructions that they use to produce these, they don't seem to apply the cubic three folds. Um, so, yeah, so this is, this is a, a sort of a vexing. In fact, I don't think I know of any cubic hypersurfaces that are stably rational, but are not rational. I think that that was the last slide that I left out of my talk. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Um, and so there's a question from, from Armand Brumaire. What if we replace C by the algebraic closure of Q? Uh, I don't think that that has a very substantial difference. I think that if you look at the the sort of the Konsevich chinkle loci, parameterizing rational constructions, those are all definable over Q bar. Uh, so there's not a, 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 a substantial change when you go from, from Q bar into Q, at least in terms of the geometric structure of the rationality loci. Uh, well, one question would be, when you talk about countable union of sub, uh, sub varieties uh, vary, it would make a, a difference. You might not have any red points or do you know that you have red points you know, in in an earlier picture of yours? Ah, so so that so let me formalize. Yeah. So um yeah. So maybe so that I get let me let me write the question to make sure I understand it. So so in cases. where say the rational locus is a countable union of, of some varieties. Does the, does the complement have Q bar points? Right. Let's see. In all the cases where, where I know that the complement is not empty, I know how to produce Q bar points. But is that a theorem? I don't think that there's anything in general that guarantees that there have to be Q bar points. And the complement. That was really my question. Yes. So now I, I understand. You, but... Yeah. I, I don't. So let me just say. So no guarantee in general. But usually the proof that the complement is not empty works over a countable field. But the proofs known, they they work over over countable fields. So I don't. I have to go. I have to go sort of more deeply into the the argument, but all the proofs that we have, they would give you a, a Q rational a Q bar point. But I don't know a general reason why that has to be the case. Thank you. I've already exceeded the five minutes I was allotted for questions. Is that? But I'm. But I also don't have to be anywhere in the next. So, um, so just let me know. It's okay. We're pretty flexible with the time. But let me maybe finish with one question. Um, how about odd dimensional cubics? Do you have any guesses of about the rationality of odd dimensional cubics? Um, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so for, so no, odd dimensional cubics 
are known to be rational. or even stably rational. And so my guess, I guess I'm still being recorded here. Oh, well, my guess is that none are rational. Um, but this is only a theorem in dimension three. The, the only theorem in this direction is the clemens griffiths result. Um, the cohomology of cubic fivefolds is well understood. Uh, so we know the Hodge numbers. Um, we have a lot of information, but there aren't any substantive theorems about, or even conjectures as to how the, um, the rational cubic fivefolds might be characterized in the larger moduli space. So five folds are, are, are wide open as far as I know. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions for Brandon? If not, let's all thank Brandon again and I'll clap for everybody. Thank you very much, Brandon. Thank you so much. What a great talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Did we stop recording?